this time on the greats, Queen of the Skies, Amelia Earhart. Master of the Universe, George Lucas. Golfing legend, Annika Sorenstam. And Grace Kelly, a modern fairy tale. But first, Abdul Nasser, part two. As president of Egypt in the 1960s, Gamal Abdul Nasser was determined to modernize and improve his people's standard of living. The president increased spending on arts and culture, building a 50-acre cinema city outside Cairo to entice international film productions. Egyptian television stations and theatre companies were expanded. Scholarships awarded to painters and local film productions subsidized. Access to education was also broadened, with elite schools nationalized and open to children from a range of backgrounds. Arab socialism promised a new era for some of the Middle East's most disadvantaged people. But as well as reforming Egypt, Nasser kept tight hold on the reins of power. He imprisoned political opponents, censored the media, and manipulated elections. But the Middle East was a powder keg waiting to blow. Nasser's Egypt jostled for position in both the Arab world and in the strategic world that was maintained in an edgy stalemate by the Cold War superpowers. By declaring Egypt as non-aligned, Nasser attempted to play the Soviets off against the Americans, raking in billions of Soviet dollars in infrastructure development and military aid. But both the USSR and the United States were concerned at Egypt's antagonism towards Israel. In 1958, Egypt and Syria had declared a united Arab Republic, but the dream of Arab unity founded when Syria pulled out of the Union in 1961 following a military coup. The president also became embroiled in a costly military exercise in 1962 when he sent troops to Yemen against the advice of his ambassador. Nasser expected a quick victory against pro-Saudi forces. However, three years later, troop commitments had escalated from 5,000 to 55,000 soldiers, and Nasser's standing in the Arab world was severely diminished. But to regain some respect, Nasser acted on a warning from the Soviet Union that Israel was preparing to attack Syria and remilitarize the Sinai, the strip of desert between Israel and Egypt. He coordinated a multi-pronged Arab attack on Israel involving Egypt, Jordan and Syria. However, a preemptive strike by Israel's Air Force on the 5th of June 1967 destroyed almost all of Egypt's bombers and fighter jets while they were still sitting on the tarmac. The Israelis also defeated Egypt on the Sinai and the Gaza Strip and easily accounted for Jordan and Syria. By the end of the war, Israel had seized the Gaza Strip, Golan Heights, the Sinai Peninsula and the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, tripling its territory. Nasser was humiliated and resigned the presidency. The whole war took less than a week and repercussions from the Six-Day War are still being felt in the Middle East today. Nasser swiftly launched the War of Attrition in an attempt to win back the Sinai. For three years, hostilities dragged on, with the USSR and the United States closely involved, both in supplying arms and trying to end the conflict. On August the 7th, 1970, a ceasefire was reached. Less than two months later, Nasser died of a heart attack following a meeting of Arab leaders to discuss Israel. More than five million people attended his funeral, the largest in history. Nasser left a mixed legacy. He modernized Egypt, reformed education, and reawoke pride in Arab culture and achievements. But Nasserism was too highly dependent on Soviet aid to be sustainable. So since the USSR's collapse, Egypt has struggled economically. And Israel's relationship with the Arab world remains on a knife edge, riven by tensions over territory taken by Israel during the Six-Day War. However, Nasser's place in history is assured. Modern-day Nasserites have redefined his political objectives and replaced authoritarianism with democracy. 
There is no doubt that whatever his faults, and there were many, NASA wanted what was best for his people. When 11-year-old Amelia Earhart saw her first aeroplane at the Iowa State Fair, she was less than interested, describing it as a thing of rusty wire and wood. She was in her early 20s when a World War I ace in a Toronto flying exhibition flew his plane directly at her and a friend in an attempt to scare them. Earhart stood her ground and later credited the moment with awakening her passion for flying. I did not understand it at the time, she said but I believe that little red aeroplane said something to me as it swished by. Two years later, Earhart took her first flight and decided to become a pilot. To pay for flying lessons, she drove a truck and worked at the local telephone company. She'd soon bought her own aeroplane and in 1923 became the 16th woman in America to be granted a pilot's license. Earhart became well known as a pilot but had to sell her yellow biplane when she suffered financial problems. But her aviation career got back on track in 1928, when she was selected to be the first woman to fly across the Atlantic, albeit as a passenger, because she did not have instrument training. While in the United Kingdom, Earhart bought a new plane, which she shipped back to the States. She was now a full-fledged celebrity, dubbed the Queen of the Air and Lady Lindy, because of her resemblance to aviator Charles Lindbergh. Crowds cheered her in ticker tape parades. She visited the White House, and she earned thousands of dollars from product endorsements. Soon after returning from the UK, Earhart became the first woman to fly solo across the North American continent and back. She also took part in competitive flying and was an active campaigner for female pilots, endorsing separate aviation records for women. Marriage to publisher George Putnam in 1931 didn't slow her down, and the following year Earhart became the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic. She landed in Ireland 14 hours and 56 minutes after leaving Newfoundland. In 1935, she entered the record books as the first person to fly solo across the Pacific, from Honolulu to mainland America. The 2,408-mile flight took 18 hours, Earhart was at the height of her popularity when she set out on her final flight in 1937, a round-the-world 29,000-mile epic flight, accompanied by navigator Fred Noonan. In a custom-built Lockheed Electra, Earhart and Noonan traveled 22,000 miles across four continents. But on the 2nd of July, the aircraft mysteriously disappeared, and the wreckage has never been found, sparking numerous conspiracy theories. The Federal Bureau of Investigation has received many reports, including claims that Earhart and Noonan were captured by the Japanese and later executed. However, the most credible explanation is that Earhart and Noonan were forced to ditch their aircraft into the sea near Gardner Island. A woman's skeleton was discovered there in 1940 and removed to Fiji for examination, but later lost. Recent archaeological excavations have uncovered improvised tools an aluminium panel that could be from an Electra and part of a woman's shoe. After 13 years of, of research, after five expeditions, we know for certain now that something very odd happened on that island in a, in a time period right around the time Earhart disappeared. We don't know for sure what that thing that happened was, but it left behind a castaway marooned on the island who died there and seems to have been a woman of Earhart's ethnic background and general stature. So somebody who looked a lot like Amelia Earhart died on that island. But with no conclusive evidence yet emerging, it's possible this mystery may never be solved.
had an amazing, amazing worldwide tour together over the last 30 years. And um, I love this man. He is my brother. He's my best friend. And from one honorary night to a Jedi night, I give you all George Lucas. The accolades just kept coming for film great George Lucas, who's built a billion dollar motion picture empire on the back of his most famous film, Star Wars, released in 1977. Lucas became interested in film as a teenager, studying at the Southern California School of Cinematic Arts. Lucas has always credited his alma mater with inspiring his passion for film, and in 2006, he gave a generous $175 million bequest to build and maintain a state-of-the-art film school. In 1973, Lucas's second feature, American Graffiti, was a critical and commercial success, paving the way for his high-concept space opera. Star Wars smashed box office records and cause Lucas had the foresight to relinquish his director's fee in exchange for sequel and merchandising rights, he made his fortune. In 1975, Lucas set up visual effects company Industrial Light and Magic after discovering that 20th Century Fox had disbanded their own. In creating the Star Wars universe, ILM revolutionized special effects and were the first to use a motion control camera. Although Star Wars remains the seminal film for a generation of moviegoers, making it wasn't all plain sailing. Many of the crew dismissed it as a children's film, and star Harrison Ford himself complained about the quality of the dialogue, telling Lucas, you can type this shit, George, but you sure can't say it. Nevertheless, Star Wars launched Ford's career, and four years later, Lucas produced the Spielberg-directed Raiders of the Lost Ark that made Ford into the world's top movie star. Although he's been nominated for four Academy Awards, Lucas has only one Oscar, joining the likes of Walt Disney and Daryl Zanuck by receiving the Irving G. Thalberg Award in 1991. This honorary Academy Award is presented to creative producers whose bodies of work reflect a consistently high quality of motion picture production. Lucas received the American Film Institute Life Achievement Award in 2005, soon after completing the final film of his second trilogy, Star Wars Episode III, Revenge of the Sith. He joked that because he considered the entire Star Wars series as one movie, he was entitled to the award now that he had gone back and finished the movie. Filmmakers, writers, and science fiction buffs all revere Lucas, and after starring in two Star Wars sequels, even Harrison Ford has changed his tune. The man's a genius. You know, I mean, he's, uh, he's a wonderful storyteller and a very inventive uh, storyteller, and he's had, had an enormous in, in, impact on, on culture. The Star Wars franchise has now generated more than $4 billion, and following a successful series of prequels, Lucas is developing a television series. He's sanguine about the way his career has panned out. Well, it's, um, before I went into the second trilogy, I kind of had to accept the fact that this was gonna be my life, that my middle name was gonna be Star Wars and there wasn't anything I could do about it, so what difference did it make after that? So after that, I kind of came to terms with the fact that that was the way my life was gonna be defined. He's put his money where his mouth is, and he's got the most incredible facilities, and he's pushing, you know, the envelope of film and, and the technical um, abilities of it. So I think we're all here to salute him. He's a, a master. One of the most successful women players in the history of golf is Sweden's Annika Sorenstam, who was born in 1970 and cut her golfing teeth here at the Bro Bolster Golf Course in Stockholm. Growing up, she lived about five minutes away from the course with her mother Gunilla, father Tom, 
and sister Charlotta, who also became a professional golfer. In May 2003, Sorenstam faced considerable controversy when she was invited to play in the Bank of America Colonial Golf Tournament, the PGA, making her the first woman to play against the men for more than 50 years. I think her weakness would be her putting and, uh, um, and chipping around the green. Um, her strength would probably be her um, ability to perform under pressure. Richard Nielsen used to play at Bro Bolster with Sarmstam. If she would make the cut, it would be very, very impressive, I think, under the circumstances with all the pressure and everything. I think it would be very difficult to, to make the cut. Sarmstam is already giving back to the sport that has so far earned her over $20 million. In 1997, Petra Lindgren received an Annika Sarmstam Junior Girls Foundation Scholarship. Petra supports Sarmstam playing in the PGA, but does not want all tournaments to be mixed. I think there are genetic things that makes that makes it so men and women aren't equal by any means. I mean, men are always going to hit longer than women and things like that. And I don't think you can have like a tour where you play together really on, this, on the same circumstances. But her playing in this tournament, I think, is a really good thing. The first woman to compete with men on the golf course was the extraordinary Babe Zaharias, who qualified for the Los Angeles Open in 1945. Mildred Ella Didrikson acquired the nickname Babe after Babe Ruth when she hit five home runs in a single baseball game. She is often considered to be the greatest all-round female athlete of all time, excelling at baseball, track and field events, diving, roller skating and bowling, as well as golf, which she didn't even take up until 1935 when she was 24. Despite her lack of golf experience, she was so good that she was denied amateur status, which led to her competing in the 1938 Men's PGA Los Angeles Open. She missed the cut, but still delighted her legion of fans. By 1950, she'd won every golfing title there was. Adding together both professional and amateur trophies meant she won a staggering 82 golf tournaments. Annika Sorenstam has faced challenges of her own during her career. In the late 90s, her career stalled, as having achieved all her major goals, her hunger for success deserted her. Australian Carrie Webb became the top LPGA Tour player, so Sorenstam renewed her approach, adopting a new exercise program, including weightlifting, and was soon back at the top of her game, adding 20 meters to her drive in the process. In the 2001 season, she became the only woman golfer to score 59 in a competition. And in 2006, she topped the first ever official women's world golf rankings. Since turning professional, she has racked up an impressive list of achievements. In her career to date, her scorecard details 86 professional wins, including 69 official LPGA tournaments and 10 majors. In the last couple of years, Sorenstam has begun to place greater focus on life after golf, with her real estate activities and investments taking up more of her time. Her Annika Golf Academy opened in 2007, and among the golfing instructors is her sister, Charlotte. Sorenstam is also looking to tie together three of her greatest passions, golf, fitness, and cooking, under her own brand, with the tagline, Share My Passion. If her business ventures achieve half that of her sporting ones, continued success for Annika Sorenstam is all but guaranteed. Even in these post-feminist times, if you ask a very young girl what she'd like to be when she grows up, the chances are movie star or princess would be amongst the answers. But how many little girls would dare to dream of becoming both? Until her tragically early death at the age of 52, Grace Kelly led a life that read like the perfect fairy tale. She was born to a prominent and wealthy Philadelphia family in November 1929 and attended the prestigious Ravenhill Academy. Her remarkable natural beauty led her to early modeling work. Training at New York's American Academy of Dramatic Arts was followed by a Broadway production. 
It didn't take too long for Hollywood to sit up and notice. And by the age of 22, she was cast opposite Gary Cooper in the hugely popular western High Noon. Many more film successes followed, including Magamba with Clark Gable, Country Girl opposite Bing Crosby, which earned her an Academy Award for Best Actress, and Dial M for Murder, directed by Alfred Hitchcock and co-starring Ray Milland. The Royal Romance, The Swan, was thought to have been made by MGM to capitalize on Grace's relationship with Prince Rainier III, although that had yet to become public knowledge. Grace's final film was The Delightful High Society, a musical version of the Philadelphia story in which she was perfectly cast as the stunningly beautiful but imperious ice queen Tracy Lord. Grace had first met Prince Rainier of the tiny principality of Monaco in 1955 at the Cannes Film Festival. They began to correspond by mail, and before the year was out, Rainier had proposed. I think just uh, taking a step of marriage is enough to give a girl a bit of a twinge. Uh, on marrying uh, His Highness, I will become monogasque, but I will also retain my American citizenship. Does that go for your children, too? Uh, I don't know about that as yet. Having accepted Rainier's proposal, Grace, along with a large contingent of family and friends, including a poodle and 80 pieces of luggage, set sail from New York on the SS Constitution, bound for the French Riviera. Thousands saw her off, and some 20,000 lined the streets of Monaco to welcome her to her new home, which in a country of only 32,000 people was no mean feat. The wedding was in two parts. First, there was the 40-minute long civil ceremony of the 18th of April. Then the following day, there was the church ceremony at Monaco's St. Nicholas Cathedral. Oscar-winning designer Helen Rose created Grace's dress, and the 600-strong crowd featured such famous faces as Gloria Swanson, Ava Gardner, the Aga Khan, and David Niven. The newlyweds returned to the US for a visit, and then in January 1957, just nine months and four days after the wedding, Grace gave birth to their first child, Princess Caroline. Two other children followed. Prince Albert, the current ruler of Monaco, was born in March 1958, and seven years later, in February 1965, Princess Stephanie completed the family. Grace took to royal life with ease. Although she sometimes contemplated returning to the silver screen, Prince Rainier was adamantly against the idea and even banned her films from being shown in Monaco. After a quarter of a century of gracious service, the much-loved princess died suddenly in September 1982 when she suffered a stroke at the wheel of her car, causing it to veer off the road and plunge over 30 meters down a mountainside. The only other occupant of the car was Princess Stephanie, who was injured, but recovered fully. Grace was buried in the family vault at Monaco's St. Nicholas Cathedral, and 23 years later, Prince Rainier, then aged 81, was laid to rest alongside her.